Okay. Um, all right. So today we're going to start the first hour and a half on Augustine. That was what we covered the second hour and a half last time. And then the second hour and a half will cover Aquinas. All right. So um, you might ask, why do we have to study the stuff that seems so abstract? I don't know how abstract it seems to you or not. I think some of you might think about it quite a bit. Some of you, not at all. Some of you, hopefully, will start to realize that your parents, the culture you grew up in, had a philosophy. And it affected the way you were raised and the way you were raised to think. So most of you are aware that the cultures you grew up in have false beliefs about women. They think women aren't, either they don't have the same natural capacities as men, or even if they do, they shouldn't be encouraged to develop those capacities because then they won't be good wives and mothers. So AUW, the foundation of AUW is spiritual humanism. Um, it's usually framed in terms of the United Nations capabilities model. And my job is to show you that actually there's an ancient model that fits this also. So that you have a chance to integrate ancient spiritual humanism with contemporary spiritual humanism. Aristotle was sexist, so we want to throw that out but there's other parts of Aristotle you probably want to incorporate in your view of a healthy psyche. Okay, that the second, I did have three students post on um, Seneca and Tranquility and they're all very good posts. Um, one of them, in, if, one, I mean, they just, the students just realized that, yes, I actually do think like this. I just didn't realize it was a system. So that's part of my job. Another big issue that came up in a post is that Aristotle has both the personal virtues and the political virtues. And for a lot of you, the culture you grew up in so far the focus has been on personal and maybe social, maybe at school, but not political so much. So in developing countries, there might be a tendency not to talk about politics or just to assume they're all corrupt, but that's a big mistake because we are political beings. We do depend on living together under a body of laws. We depend on equal representation under the law, equal treatment under the law. And so it's important to be informed because if you don't cultivate that capacity, you'll, you'll never develop an honest democracy. The United States is losing its democracy because even though our founders were really obsessed about citizens developing uh, practical wisdom about citizenships, um, American citizens are not doing that and they're failing and the political system is failing. So lessons learned, people in developing countries should realize they need to stay informed hold their politicians accountable, find out about the background of the political leaders, who they're networking with, what they've done in the past, so that you develop a history of the political leadership class and how corrupt it is 
to what extent do they actually rule for the benefit of the rules? Anyway, that was one of the people who posted, commented on that. Another comment was that actually tranquility does mean a lot to the student and also suffering, sorting out which kinds of suffering you experience and what the causes are and what you can and cannot do about them so that you can have agency, right? So that you can have a sense that you, you can control your life and you can form your life as much as is humanly possible. So um, I do want you all to think about tranquility. I think it's obviously very relevant <laughs> because, you know, you're under a lot of stress, right? That means you're not tranquil <laughs> and it's understandable. It's just that how do you get to be more tranquil, I think is by going through this sort of examination process and learning how to, um, learning what, what's appropriate, you know, which emotions, thoughts, and actions are really appropriate to the situation. Um, I also think friendship, having someone to talk to who's really reliable and won't give you bad advice, <laughs> that's another big problem, of course. If somebody you trust really isn't trustworthy, they're ignorant or they're distorted in their judgment, then it's that's a problem too. But anyway, I hope you would at least be convinced that that model of flourishing is relevant and important to sort out in your mind. Now, this the next one is Augustine. Augustine is um, focuses on guilt, all right? So I do want you to think about to what extent were you raised like the woman who describes her experience in the newspaper article, right? Was sin a big deal in the way you were raised? And a number of students have said that, and they're from many different countries. So um, I, I think you should sort it out in your mind. Even if you were not raised that way, you should realize, gee, I was not raised with that. And then, you know, if that was good or bad, I would think that a student at AUW who was raised without sin, it was probably fine because obviously she's still motivated she has some kind of motive other than fear or guilt, right, for being here. So all of you have achieved a lot. Was it based on fear or guilt or was it based on just the desire to flourish, to develop your talents? So I think you ought to sort those things out in your mind. I think that when people are motivated by guilt or fear, politicians can take advantage of that. And because it's a disturbed frame of mind, <laughs> but um, you can have this view of reality without all of that guilt. So let me go over it once more but when you get into breakout groups, please, by now you really ought to have something to say, okay? I gave you a chance, right? I gave you an hour and a half and then time between class. Now I'm repeating it. So you are responsible for having some way to keep the discussion going and alive and high quality. All right, so the first part of it was Augustine's personal conversion experience. Again, I do not know how many of you 
live in a society where you're supposed to have uh, a conversion experience. I, I don't, anyway, I really don't know. I know that in America, the Baptist church, the parents, when the kids get to be about 12 years old, they're sort of hanging out, waiting for their kids to get like converted <laughs> by God, right? The grace of God is just going to come in there and zap them. Um, and that's just a big deal. And I, it's not my thing. And I have a lot of suspicions about it because my students used to say, well, once you're saved, you're always saved. So I can go drinking on Saturday night and I can go to church on Sunday and I'm saved. And that that is super corrupt. But um, that doesn't mean all examples of conversion experiences are corrupt but it does mean that people can deceive themselves and they can become deluded about, you know, I know that God saves me or forgives me or something like that. But that's the, the story that Augustine told about his childhood. Each of you might have certain events in your life that you thought were particularly important that they revealed something about the universe or about you or about your calling in life, what you feel like you really want to do that makes this huge contribution that you understand the world needs and that you can meet that need. So experiences like that, I would call them philosophical conversions. Your mind was just opened up or the light of your mind went off without having to worry that there's some God in the sky that punched a button or something. But again, it's people are raised differently. Then there is that spiritual quest. Have you been through this desire to find something to live for, right? Um, and this was his example, but um, everyone might, everyone ha has their own. Um, and I've had a number of AUW students who have really excellent examples of that. Um, one of the students in a post said that her friends spent her life trying to pass the, the exam to get into medical school. And then she didn't pass. And like it was the end of her life and she got depressed. And she said the whole society is sort of geared toward that. But she gave advice to her friends saying, it just means that wasn't what you were meant to do. So then um, the, the reason, one of many reasons I like liberal arts colleges is you have to take a lot of classes, but each of those classes shows you some other aspect of spiritual humanism, some other kind of call that people get. So you have to take the arts or theater performance, something like that. And then you start, the point is that it releases your psyche. It, it gives you a healthier psyche. And so the teachers of those subjects were the ones who took that and went, this is what I can do. I understand why this is important. Other people don't. I do, and I can do it in a way that communicates that to my students. So that's how I was with philosophy, right? These different ideas of reason, these different ideas of the universe are really driving people. They just don't know it and they should know it because all around the world, there is what's called a culture war, right? And people profoundly disagree and they can't get along and politicians can take advantage of it. So sort through in your mind, 
what you think reason is, what you think faith is, whether you think faith is part of life at all or just socially constructed. What about reason, the different kinds of reasoning that we do, what do they tell us about the meaning of life? Okay, so uh, Augustine came from the Christian perspective, Old and New Testament, but Muhammad said the Quran, he's the seal of the prophets, that ba basically Jesus died too soon, so human beings didn't have enough of a guidebook for how to live out the holy life. And so Muhammad was sent to finish the job. So that was his way of uniting reason and faith. Um, all right, so there's that. Do you understand your life in terms of a conversion experience? Um, then, there was his way, the inner rules of truth, right? Inside of our heads, we, we exist, we understand things, we take in with science and all sorts of math, but at the highest level is reason, right? Um, we know that we see, okay, reason is knowing that you know right? Reason is judging. Um, well, what does this scientific knowledge tell me about ultimate truth or the meaning of life? You can get a lot of scientific knowledge. It doesn't necessarily have any meaning. Uh, it depends upon how you apply it. It depends upon what you think human beings place in the world is. Um, all right, so Augustine thought our mathematical capacities were the most important because we can know eternal truths. Two plus two is four forever. Now, we can't have gotten that understanding by looking at material things, right? Material things are not numbers. We use number to count them, but the number itself never changes. The things we count change, but the counting and the mathematical relationships and all the patterns that you recognize in math, those aren't related to the world at all. So that's something um, that links us to God, okay? Um, each of us has our own mind. We can, uh, we can recognize that we see the same things. We can recognize that we all understand math. We have the concepts of unity, reasoning, and we have it at a pretty young age, right? Two-year-olds, three-year-olds, they start counting. And so counting is superimposing something in our heads onto the world. Um, all right, we also have these rules that, again, they don't come from experience. They really come from reason. Everyone thinks he's wise. Everyone wants to be happy. These are ideas stamped on our minds. Wisdom is the truth in which the highest good is figured out. Wisdom, okay, wisdom is one thing, right? It's the same thing, the use of our reason. But people disagree on how they will become happy, okay? The universal rules, we ought to live justly. The inferior is subject to the superior. Everyone should be given what, what is owed. The uncorrupted is better than the corrupted. The eternal is better than the temporal. Okay, how do you apply those rules, right? Okay, so we can all agree that virtue is a good thing. Or we can all agree that virtue is a part of flourishing. 
but we totally disagree on who is a virtuous person or whether this was a virtuous choice. But we don't disagree on the ideas themselves, okay? And he's saying we got we didn't get those ideas from observing the world. We got them from uh, God, basically. Our reason is a gift from God. God gave us reason so we would know how to use our free will. So our knowledge, the truths in our mind, leads us to recognizing that there's something eternal and immutable that holds everything in place. Our knowledge leads us to recognizing the fallibility of our own reasoning. Okay, I know that I knew some things before, um, that I didn't know things earlier in life that I know now. So I know my mind is not infallible. But I know, um, so I know that no human mind is infallible. So there must be a higher mind that keeps things in place, right? I know that ma the material world doesn't order itself in any ultimate way. And so there must be an eternal cause that keeps everything um, overall ordered, ordered in, a, in a, oh, an overall way so things don't fall apart. Um, let's see. All right. Everything has two parts. Um, number is eternal. Okay. So God, it's reasonable to think there's a God that causes all of this to be the way it is. Something is higher than the human mind. Either this is God or God is even higher than that. Therefore, God exists. Uh, we don't create truth. We recognize the truth. The eternal is more powerful. We criticize based on our ideas. Um, okay. Therefore, we possess inner rules according to which we judge. When we establish societies, we try to imitate the eternal. A just society, society is one where everything is ordered. We have these inner rules. Evil people deserve to be wretched. Good people deserve to be happy. Well-ordered societies deserve to elect their leaders. Um, okay, then we try to apply these unchanging laws to particular situations. That's when we disagree or our judgment gets corrupted. Um, let's see, human laws are written. We use, when we write human laws, they're, they use the threat of locking somebody up um, to get them to behave. But really, that's, that's not what, you, what should be motivating you. The human laws can never condemn a person for sin, for turning toward the temporal. It can never give someone true freedom. True freedom is the love of God, the love of the eternal. Okay, so truth and wisdom are higher than human society, and we can recognize that with our minds. Whenever we achieve justice, we can tell it's because we're referring our actions to these innate ideas. Um, the human mind knows its limitations. Okay. All right. So the eternal is more powerful. Our minds understand the eternal. Our minds are more powerful by nature than the temporal. Therefore, we should never act in any way that isn't, doesn't follow eternal laws, but we do act that way. Therefore, we must have been given free will by God 
to choose either to be motivated by the eternal or the temporal. Um, that's how your will can, okay, can be divided against itself. You can, um, okay, you can have an internal conflict. Oh, okay, the problem of evil. Let me see if I can find, yeah, get an outline here. Yeah, so the problem of evil. And so he's just proven that free will exists, right? And that reason understands the eternal laws according to which we should act, but we have to choose it because we can always choose to turn to the temporal and act on the basis of lust or greed or pleasure or pain rather than to act on the basis of eternal, eternal truth. truth. Okay, okay, let's see. Um, I guess I'll go through this and then I'll take some questions and then I'll put you into groups. Um, all right. Rational beings can always, they should always act according to reason and they can, but they don't. So that's why we know there's such a thing as free will. Now, if God is perfect and all powerful, why is there evil in the world? Well, it's because of the nature of evil, okay? God created a universe. And he had to choose between a universe with a creature with free will or a universe without a creature with free will. And God created the universe with the creature with free will because when that creature chooses good, they become virtuous. And when they choose to treat each other justly, they create a whole realm of human culture based on justice. So a world that has virtue and justice is more perfect than a world that doesn't have either one. The problem is the world with the creature with free will also has the capacity for evil, okay? God did not create free will to enable you to do evil. God didn't expect you to do evil. God didn't want you to do evil, but God gave you the potential to do evil because God also, because if you have free will, you have to choose to do good. You can't just do it automatically the way uh, a horse does, for example. So, this distinguishes people from animals completely, right? This is a huge gap between people and animals. And in the back of your mind, because this course is about a healthy psyche, do you think this is a healthy point of view? Do you think this point of view is the best way to guide you in your life? so that you can live the best possible life. This is what Augustine is saying. He's saying you can't live virtuously without the grace of God um, and, and also reason. You need the grace of God and you need reason. Um, okay, but we can tell how we're supposed to use free will because when people turn toward the eternal, they're happy. And when they turn toward evil, they become unhappy. They become internally conflicted. Um, let's see. No one has to sin in order for the universe to be perfect. As long as sinners are unhappy, the universe is perfect. And sinners are unhappy because they're always conflicted. Um, okay, evil is this turning of the soul toward um, the temporal, 
It's not part of God's plan. God only created free will, which included the capacity for evil. Um, it's just like God didn't create blindness. God created sight, and every once in a while, somebody is born without it. God, God didn't create the blindness. Um, okay, God's foreknowledge. Um, if God foreknew people were going to sin, he still created free will because the universe was still better. Plus, then there's the final judgment. So after death, the, the evil, evil people will be punished good people will be rewarded. So whatever is not resolved in this life is resolved in the next life. And it's reasonable to believe that because reason requires it. And God wouldn't have given us reason unless we could ultimately be satisfied. Our reason could be satisfied. So it's not satisfied in this world because people choose evil, but there is eternal salvation or damnation. So ultimately we should believe that there will be a final judgment. Um, okay, the other thing is God created Adam and Eve and they chose to turn away so now uh, people are born with a desire to do evil just because it's evil. So that's why they need the grace of God. So human reason is not powerful enough. You also need grace, but that's because of the sin of Adam. Um, God does not cause sin, all right? Human being, human reason, understands the future of things that occur by necessity. So I know five years from now, if I'm alive, I'll be older. All right? Um, but we don't know, human beings do not foreknow what people choose through their free will. That's why we keep thinking if God foreknows choices, God must cause them or they must be by necessity. But that's not true. So if you, you have to believe, this is an article of faith that God foreknows what we choose just because God is omniscient and foreknows everything and knows everything. But that's an article of faith. That's not an article of reason. Um, God's interventions in history. He intervenes in order to get people uh, back to God. Um, they reinforce what we know through our reason. Um, during the time of the Romans, they did not believe in God. They were given an empire that was their reward for whatever virtue they had. And when they became too corrupt, they lost it. The Christians focus on eternal life, so they don't get power or wealth. They don't want it. Um, so the cause of historical events is not purely accidental. It's not fatal. It's not true that human beings can't do anything. And um, human kingdoms are established by divine providence. When people are virtuous, there is a reward. Um, there is an order to, to human affairs. Now this comes up right when 9-11 happened. I do not know what was going on in your country and probably most of you weren't even born, but I don't know what your parents or other people say. Maybe they don't talk about it at all, I don't know. Um, but people in the US were saying, oh, God, this is God's judgment on us because those liberals, those secularists and feminists and homosexualities were taking over our country. And so God allowed this to happen as punishment 
for our sin. <laughs> and I, yeah, there's millions of Americans who really believe that. So that's why, again, as I teach this to you, some of you might think this is totally ridiculous. It's totally dated. I didn't come to college to learn this. And other students will say, this is how I was raised. Um, but I think just as a, as a well-informed human being and intellect and uh, educated person, you, you do need to know that people, a lot, millions of people think some variation of this view. Um, so there's God's interventions in history. There's God's interventions in people's personal lives. Um, all right. So now I will take questions for, for a while, right? 15 minutes. And then we get into groups for 15 minutes. And then we'll move on to the next topic. So what would you like to ask? Professor? Yes. Uh, I'm wondering, Professor, if there's any relationship between Augustine and uh, Plato or Aristotle. Um, I found like there is some similarities between Augustine and Plato's view of virtue. Okay, very good. Good question. Um, what we're gonna talk about right after Augustine is Aquinas. So Aquinas was also a Catholic priest and he rejected Augustine's view of reason and science and he replaced it with Aristotle, okay? So that's why it's a really good question. Um, but at the moment, we're just talking about Augustine and about his rejection of the temporal, right? This notion that we must focus on the eternal and we must reject the temporal. Um, that's different than Aristotle, right? For Aristotle, there's nothing sinful about sex. It's just, it needs to be in moderation and it needs to be connected to marriage because children need stable adults to raise them. It's just basically the way the species of human beings functions is that people need to limit their sexual behavior to long-term committed relationships. But that's just a, a biology, a biological sort of analysis of how to combine our bio, biology with our need, our cultural, our basic cultural needs. Uh, but with Augustine, it's much more, uh, he's much more emphatic about that physical pleasures are evil, right? And you definitely minimize them and keep focused on the eternal. And so that's why it, there's a lot more guilt in Augustine. In theory, there's no guilt in, in Aristotle. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, Professor, thank you. Okay. I know that students sometimes write about that they were raised with a lot of guilt. Um, I was actually, my dad never wanted me to feel guilty, but I was a preacher's kid and I was supposed to save the world and I wasn't saving the world. So I did feel guilty. <laughs> But it was because I wasn't saving the world. It wasn't, I wasn't guilty about sex or anything. It was just like, you're supposed to save the world for God. <laughs> I'm like, okay, hey God, I can't do this. And <laughs> nobody wants to be saved, you know? <laughs> you can't save it if they don't, you know, do what they're supposed to do. Yeah. I mean, it really did. It was really hard on me for a long time. I had to grow out of that. It was hard. Um, anyway, so that's why I do think whatever you learn about good and evil, really, it really, you know, it affects your mind, whatever that is. Any other questions? 
Uh, Professor Augustine mentioned that uh, uh, God intervenes uh, sometimes, but it, it doesn't mean that we don't have free will. So I was wondering what he mean by that. And then uh, we also heard and, and we have this kind of faith and belief that God sent messenger for us to guide us. And then the goal of that messenger was, you know, to guide uh, people. Uh, so if that was the goal, if he was born like that, so can we say that he had free will? He had what? The messenger had free will or he was uh, created for this goal. Um, right, to guide. That's, very, that's a really good question because, um, uh, you know, the theory, the belief is that God did intervene, right? So um, God sent Jesus as the, and the Christians think Jesus is the Messiah, right? Jesus is God in the flesh and blah, blah. And um, whereas Muslims think that Jesus was just another prophet. He was a wonderful prophet. He kept trying to lead people away from sin toward God just like the other prophets, but uh, Jesus died too soon. And so people just didn't learn about, well, well I'm gonna get married and I'm gonna have a job and I'm gonna have kids. So God sent Muhammad to, to be a role model of how to really assimilate this, right? How to integrate the eternal with the temporal. So you have the five pillars, you have praying five times a day. Muhammad himself was a businessman. And then he was a husband and a father. And he was a political leader. So, so God sent Muhammad to be a model to, uh, that went way beyond Jesus. Because Jesus, you know, he never got married, never had a job. So, so that's a, a belief about God's interventions in history, right? And so then you can think about, well, what do you think, right? And um, on the one hand, it makes sense. On the other hand, what happens when religion gets used as a weapon, right? So that I'm a Christian and I think Jesus was a Messiah. And therefore, I think all Muslims are horrible and they deserve to die, right? Or I'm a Muslim and I think that it's a terrible belief to think Jesus was God, that's heresy, that's awful. And I think Christians deserve to die. And there are a lot of Muslims and Christians who use those doctrines, those beliefs to justify killing each other, going to war against each other, hating each other. So what do you think of that, right? You each have to resolve that. In my view, it's, if you are virtuous, fine. If you're not, forget it. I don't care what your doctrine is. I don't think religion, religious doctrine should ever be used as a way to justify wicked behavior <laughs> and that we all have a common humanity. If you use religion to treat another person in an inhumane way, I don't believe you, right? I think you're corrupt. I don't, I, so that's my opinion, but I just think each student has to work it out. So I give you those virtues I think every major religion that's the focus is to be virtuous, but there are these doctrines and there are these beliefs. And when 9-11 happened, millions of Americans turned against the liberals, the feminists, the gays, and the politicians took advantage of it because they thought, our country was being given over to these people, these awful secularists. And so God allowed this to happen. I think that's not intellectually honest, right? You don't know that. 
what you know is if somebody's generous or not, <laughs> right? But it's up to you. Another question? Uh, professor, so uh, my a part of second question was like, uh, so if God created, so if uh, Augustine is saying that uh, the God in, interferes sometimes, maybe God intervene in our relationship, but it does not mean that we don't have free will. But then we have this messengers uh, and then uh, who, who were there and burned because to guide us, right? So, uh, so are they burned for this, you know, for this uh, uh, goal? If so, if, they, if God created them uh, for this goal and reason, so can we say that they have really free will or they were like assigned this goal already when they burned? Because we have this kind of faith that um, like Muhammad, uh, when he, he was very child, uh, God, uh, you know, outed the evil from his head. And, and from that childhood, he was very, you know, um, very holy person, something like that. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I, um, I think that you should just sort through, right? You've been taught this and you should think about, well, what do I think about that? And then at AUW, they allow for a lot of beliefs. They just say, but it's, but you can never justify treating another human being in an inhumane way, right? In the, in the name of your religion, right? The campus climate is really about women developing their capabilities, right? Their Aristotelian virtues. And if you can be a good Muslim and do that, fine. But we can't put up with students who tell each other, you know, I know you're going to hell or something, right? Because you're not Muslim. That is something that the campus climate, you know, rejects. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, Professor, thank you. I do think in a sense, the campus climate gives you a big opportunity for separating out what's really important about your religion versus what's really not, <laughs> what's corrupt about, you know, corrupted ways to understand it. So it really gives you an alternative way of living that gives you that opportunity. Like you can have a roommate who is not Muslim, but is truly a virtuous person. And then you can separate out. Well, you can say, yeah, but Muhammad taught, this is the way Muhammad taught us to live. And, you know, I don't care if my roommate does it in the name of Muhammad, as long as she lives well, right? Um, so that's, that's the kind of thing. Uh, and you should, in this class especially, it's just, what is a healthy psyche? Is it healthy to think, to uh, form your emotions and your actions on beliefs about God's interventions in history? Or is it healthier to form your beliefs and your way of life according to a model of virtues that you figure it, that's what any reasonable God would want in the first place, right? What's the healthier way to live your life? Um, all right, more questions at all? Okay, I'm gonna put you into groups and I'm gonna try to put somebody who already wrote a post, you know, who seems engaged uh, in each of those groups to be the leader or, or you can just make sure you pick a leader, somebody that keeps calling on the other people and then there's follow-up, right? When someone says something, the other students try to ask a good question or try to help them develop their thought. So you're trying to create a climate 
of dialogue, interchange. Um, all right, let's see. Um, all right. There's party. Fallock, oh dear. Um, Fourteen is number two. Number two is okay. Uh, Save come. Okay, so the one will be okay. Fardeen will be okay. Masoma will be okay. Right. So, will be okay. Um, let me move her to number four. So what, okay, so you grow up remembering stories about maybe just related to virtue and vice. You know, your parents could be secular humanists and tell stories, but most of those holy books have stories, Old Testament, New Testament, um, and Hindu, the Hindu students, Buddhist students, they, they'll talk about the stories that stuck in their mind. And if you think about it, I think you can tie those back to those natural virtues because they're based on the human condition. So the story of Joseph is a typical, that happens a lot, that powerful people um, are sexually attracted to somebody and it's inappropriate for their position in society but they're powerful, so they do it anyway, you know, and, and they have this power to take revenge or to really mess things up. And so you tell those stories in order to remind powerful people not to do stuff like that. It really messes with people. Um, all right, so then another a story I grew up with, Mary and Martha, Jesus treated women as equals. The reason there were no women disciples is because you couldn't have single women roaming around the countryside with single men or they'd get stoned, right? I mean, that just was not appropriate. So that's why, obviously, why there wouldn't be disciples, not because they're by nature inferior, right? So the very fact that there's a story about Jesus going to Mary and Martha's He's talking about the serious things in the living room with Mary and Martha's in the kitchen doing kitcheny things, uh, right? Traditional women's things. And, and, and Martha gets mad and says, Mary, you got to get up here and help me. And Jesus says, no. She says, Mary has the better part. So the idea is Jesus wanted women to be serious, right? He didn't want them to just get stuck in the kitchen and doing the kitchen things. So I think that's an amazing story because it really shows that the whole institutional church always saying women, you know, should be at home being wives and mothers. That is not what Jesus said, right? And 
as a kid growing up, that really made a big impression. I thought God was going to really get after me if I didn't get a PhD in philosophy. So, <laughs> but that's not usual, right? Most women, God is after them if they do try to do that. Does that make sense? And so you do have to understand the power of social constructions to mess with people. And especially that word God, right? It's a word, but it corresponds often to this very authoritarian, nasty man who sort of runs the roost and has a bad hair day and decides to kill your kid or something. I mean, it's really, can get really bad. Go ahead, Ashlyn. Uh, thank you, Professor. So um, as I could also connect with what you have already told that Jesus wanted, like uh, he treated women equally. He wanted to give more em emphasis and importance to women. But there are some verses in Holy Bible that actually, you know, kind of um, demean or acts. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That, uh, exactly. Uh, kind of uh, doing that kind of thing to women. So how controversial is that in that terms, Professor? Because as a Christian, we always ought to uh, believe or kind of digest the things that we are being given in the Holy Bible. But it's actually a controversy here. So how far it would be? Well, it contradicts itself, right? The Bible is contradictory. Mm -hmm. um, so actually, my view as a person who studies wisdom literature is that it was never intended to be a doctrine. It's a bunch of stories. And the stories, the people had different ideas of God. They really did, right? Noah thought that God is on top of Mount Sinai. And if he gets far enough away, the sonar, you know, <laughs> he's going to, I mean, really had a very physical idea. And then Jeremiah did not have that. I mean, the stories are literal. I think the reason they're written that way is that they give you, okay, this, this person thought about it this way, this person, so good luck, guys. You have to figure this out and you have to think about it. There's no one answer. But I would say if you have to choose between Jesus and Paul or Jesus and somebody else, like I'll pick Jesus any day, right? <laughs> but you know, it's really up to you. But I, that stuff was written, I think, expecting people to be critical thinkers and to, and to know that, that they're going to have to be accountable for what they worked out in their mind. And they can't, what, stand before the pearly gates. Oh, but my preacher told me this, you know. <laughs> my dad, you know, it's just like Adam and Eve. Wait a second, it's the snake's fault, you know? No. <laughs> so, I mean, as a philosopher, that would inevitably be my opinion. Does that answer your question? Yes, exactly, Professor. Uh, for me also, when I read some verses, I'll be like thinking, no, Jesus would not even have thought about this that way. People, <laughs> people who have written or who put it into the Bible, okay, they are telling it from their point of view and people, uh, like Jesus itself, it does not make any sense to him. So I was thinking that way itself. Yeah, I mean, as a philosopher, it's not intellectually honest. You're mm -hmm. thinking you know more than you know. You're deceiving yourself. You have an overblown ego, get over it. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you ever use religious doctrine to violate the golden rule, right? others as you want to be treated I think you know you're in trouble that's pretty basic um, so that's just the opinion of a philosopher I guess yeah thank you professor so let's see oh here's another hand very good Marjana go ahead uh, uh yeah Yes, uh, uh, Professor, I just wanted to point out a thing. Um, uh, I think uh, in some way in, in every religion, uh, every religion is sexist towards women. Uh, as a born Buddhist myself, I have always, I have grown up hearing that women are um, evil. Like I have true. committed some sin in my past life. That's why I... 
uh, was born. And That's not Marjana. That is not fair. You know, Buddha and like, thought, yeah, and and the boys they committed. Uh, they were really, really. That's my. <laughs> yes, I know. Yeah, I just think that is really a perversion of Buddhism because Buddha said women could achieve liberation. I mean, how outrageous is that? It's Hindus that used to, you know, say, oh, you just need a few more reincarnations so you can be a man, you know. But I mean, Buddhism is about people achieving liberation in this life and women were capable. So that's all right. I just, it just shows you how the culture can totally pervert. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So, yeah. yeah. It's all about culture and understand uh, it actually came from a story. Yeah, the, the time the Buddha was um, uh, meditating himself for a civil named Mara, um, he actually uh, told his uh, daughters to, you know, distract him so that he doesn't get uh, he doesn't get to be a Buddha, right? Um, so yeah, from then on, uh, it actually evil. And when men are trying to achieve something, women are always there to. Yeah, like you mentioned, well, Professor, stories. Right. It's just like Adam, he goes and blames Eve, right? And <laughs> that's what my father said. When he when he messed up, he took it like a man. He blamed a woman. All right. <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah. So what I want you to do in your posts is sort all this out in your mind, right? Each of you has different stories. Each of you... But as a philosopher, I'm going to guide you toward looking, uniting reason and faith, right? Looking at your faith through the filters of reason, because, because that is the foundation of liberal arts education. The people who started liberal arts schools knew that if you let people's faith get detached from reason, you're not going to have a democracy. You're going to have authoritarianism because people will do all sorts of crazy stuff in the name of God. But if you hold your religion accountable to reason, right? And this is how you do it. You don't just, it's not fundamentally, can we prove, you know, that Jesus' body was made up of this different substance? <laughs> That somehow, you know, it's not science in that sense, right? What was Jesus' body chemistry, right? Did he have a different kind of brain? Uh, but it's about um, the virtues, right? Running it, you know, linking faith to reason. And it would mean looking at, do they cultivate the natural virtues? Do they promote flourishing? And right and if they don't then you should reject it you know you shouldn't use religion as a political tool or as some sort of way to be self-righteous um but i think you know each of you has to sort this out in your head but the very fact that you're here and if you're a woman, developing your capabilities means that you've probably thought critically about something you were exposed to in the past, right? And so I'm preaching to the choir, I think. I just want you to do it more systematically, right? I'm giving you, you can get an A in the course for actually just sorting this stuff out in your mind. That's, you know, <laughs> there's hardly time to do it. So I'm giving you time. Um, any other questions or comments? Because now we'll go to Augustine. I mean, Aquinas, sorry. Okay, so here we are with Aquinas. He did, oh, yeah. Apologize, I raised my I... hand and yeah. apologize. I, I have something to share, Professor. 
Okay, good. I raised my hand. <laughs> yeah, but I think it didn't be okay, Professor. So in our group, Professor, uh, we can relate it to also uh, the discussion that we have in our group. So uh, um, I think, Professor, in our group, we we were we had different religious beliefs. So we had uh, we have Muslim, we have Christianity, Buddhism, uh, Hinduism. And then we found that, okay, we, we really kind of related to Augustine's, uh, uh, you know, uh, this later. So uh, even if we are not Muslim or Christian, Christian so, but, but it's still we have this kind of faith of, you know, uh, faith on God and heaven and this kind of saint and guilt. So we really related ourselves to th that <laughs> um, uh, article, so that Augustine died. So I think uh, uh, we also like examine this that, okay, uh, do we, uh, uh, are we agree with Augustine? Uh, should we, you know, uh, have this kind of psyche and, and believe that, okay, uh, we should, you know, relate ourselves with the uh, eternal world and not uh, temporary. And then uh, what religious belief do we have? Is it healthy for us to accept or not? And then we examine some of our beliefs and the uh, there are a lot of interesting find and already the other group mentioned about the sexism toward women or gender. Uh, more broadly. And then, uh, Professor, one thing that I found very offended in our one religious <laughs> is that uh, we were disagreeing this point actually. So, uh, I was, it, it is mentioned in Quran that women are good in the household chores. And then this built, uh, you know, uh, the root for the people to misinterpret it and misuse this one. And then I think this is actually a kind of tool uh, for people. Uh, so, uh, so for instance, uh, why God did not mention that women are also good in other works and works that men do or working in outside. But a uh, follow Mehwish mentioned that, uh, okay, this is up to you how to how you interpreted this, but this is uh, this not something to be offended, but this is a good point. Uh, God is mentioning, okay, you're good in the household chores. But then again, Professor, uh, I say that okay, if I'm good in the household chores, why did not uh, why uh, and I'm at the same time uh, I'm also good in other uh, works, so why did not uh, why God did not mention that? Uh, so this is the reason that people are saying okay, women should stay at home and you know do this household chores and uh, and uh, uh, br brought up the children uh, and uh, and they also don't have any you know income. Uh, and then uh, uh, I think this is uh, not a good point, <laughs> and this is sexism. Right. And then another point is that uh, it's mentioned that uh, one uh, woman witness is uh, one man wit witness is equal to two women witness. So there should be two uh, witnesses from the woman gender uh, in order to be accepted, but men can be only one. Why? Why do we have this kind of faith? <laughs> and then the, these things we should like you know we should not accept these things blindly because we are raised in this kind of uh, or we are born in a family that have this kind of faith or in a society we should uh, use our reason and I'm completely agree with this thing that we should use our reasons and we should not be Muslim hereditarily or Christian or Buddhism or Hinduism we have you know this kind of common ideas and views on all of the religious uh, but we should examine this, whether this is correct or not, whether you found it acceptable or not. And then uh, we had the discussion of the LGBT group people. <laughs> so in Islam, LGBT homosexuality is completely criminalized. They are con uh, condemned by God. And there is even death penalty for them. Uh, for instance, if we look around, around uh, a, a few uh, weeks ago, there was a, a homosexual was, uh, you know, executed. Uh, for uh, his gender, but they don't know that, you know, scientifically they prove that it's not something uh, in their power. It is, uh, they are born like this uh, and uh, it's not a psychological problem to uh, to approach a psychologist and treat him to change his gender or these things. I mean, we have to examine these things. Uh, I don't know what is the narrative behind this, why it is criminalized, but people are saying there is a narrative that you know, there was a loot ethnicity that was raping uh, their same-sex uh, same gender or have homosexuality, but that was not consensual relationship. Uh, 
that is the difference between the LGBT now, now. so yeah. they, they are not doing this or raping and people so we have to analyze these things we need really and 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 religious is like kind of weapon uh, and, and I'm agree uh, exactly on the point that religion should be a way to unite people to find a modern and organized way to live not to violence or, or be unhuman uh, to each other. And, and this is not, I, I'm sure that no religion saying this thing. And this is because we misinterpreted those things and misunderstood it, those things. So yeah, this was my Very point. Good. My okay, mind. good. I mean- Professor, I have a question. Go sorry ahead. for interruption. Go ahead. Uh, sorry, Masma, I, I have a question. Uh, did you say this, that LGBT is illegal in Islam? Did you say like this? No, I mentioned that homosexuality is criminalized. About the LGBT, it doesn't mention in Quran, but homosexuality is condemned and criminalized in, in Islam. Yeah, and do you know the reason? Uh, I have a kind of the philosophical uh, the approach uh, there, but, but it's not convincing to me. Yeah. They so are saying that we are conducting, uh, uh, they are saying that we are condemning the God lost, you know, uh, the, the reason that he got a created human being is this uh, procreation. And if we have homosexuality, then this uh, pro uh, human, you know, <laughs> human species will be <laughs> in danger. <laughs> yeah, I, the, I, just, I think I think there is a lots of reason and this is one of the reasons. So uh, we cannot say at all that they didn't mention. They have mentioned, but might be because of the long time. So there was some sources that that has been described and we are not having access to that. But it is not about that. We may say that there is not clarification about that. That was, I was uh, wanted to mention, sorry. If you mind. Okay. Yeah. I uh, no no uh, sure. I, I can take any comments you guys have. I, I'm happy to take those. And and then uh, one more thing I want to mention is that uh, 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 if you are following Islam, Quran is saying to be a complete book. There is nothing missing. So this is one point I want to mention. And then the second point about the LGBT. LGBT idea is a new concern or uh, that, that that come up. So in, in Quran, we don't have anything uh, about the lesbian or homosexual, biosexual and this thing. We have only homosexual, the general uh, 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 word homosexual, right? So I read some verses in Quran, which was condemning really, truly uh, homosexuality. And then the reason, an example of that was the loose ethnicity. And then I didn't find that convincing at all. That is not, you know, related to the modern concern and there are you know maybe that what that was you know send it at that time that was related to that situation but it's not more any more applicable in this current okay. situation so good so yeah this is my uh, yeah Very good. and and yeah. i think that will be based on the um, interpretation of the holy quran the who which person or who is uh, interpreting the Holy Quran. So I think it is based on inter interpretation that in which method, in which way they will interpret the words and the, uh, the meaning of the Holy Quran because there are a lots of words which is having multiples meaning, right? So again, it will be based on the understanding and interpretation of the words. Okay. Exactly, exactly. And Professor, one thing that I found very offensive is that during Taliban regime in Afghanistan, they were, uh, you know, uh, give a uh, death uh, execution to the homosexual people if they notice and discover this. And then I found that there is a lot of research that shows that they had this practice themselves. They were raping men in the jail, though they were themselves was men. <laughs> And still they are very doing offensive. it. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm still they are doing. Yeah, yeah. And exactly. there is so no I'm... no rule for them. Even they are uh, they are having gay people between them that yeah. they are claiming that we are Muslim. We are the real Muslim, and they are uh, killing other Muslims that you're not real. But still, they are doing illegal things that which is mentioned in the Holy Quran. 
like gay or lesbian is not allowed in islam but they are they are doing it and they are saying that we are real muslim okay well yeah, so it's not like i mean yeah we should make a, a separate difference between gay and lesbian and then those who are or sodomies so it's not consensual relationship they are raping this thing so they are not lesbian or gay so we should uh, you know well make actually, different between this one the main point for this class is that you need to unite reason and faith and so when reason exactly <laughs> when reason finds out that homosexuality some people just have that orientation then you change your faith or you just say well i mean they didn't know they just didn't know but um you know i can't make you do that because you have to sort it out in the post I, i'm not going to tell you what to think i'm not going to take away your faith but i am going to tell you that you cannot have a democracy and you, and liberal arts education was founded on insisting that faith not contradict reason it can be different than reason but it shouldn't undermine reason because then politicians and people can use religion as a weapon that's that's the main point and i know in my country after 9/11 homosexuality was used politically as a weapon it was used to win the 2004 election truly it was it was targeted all these gallup polls 11 states were within four percentage points they put a marriage amendment it was all very very cynical the people who did it did not believe homosexuality is perverted but they did it because they took gallup polls and they used irrational religion as a political tool so that that's why liberal education is formed this is the kind of education you have to agree to if you want to have a democratic society if you want to avoid authoritarianism so you know it's up to you what you think i will never try to change a person's mind but i will talk about the you know the dangers of certain views or that you might think homosexuality is bad but don't let a politician use it as a tool that's another issue but um so marjana did you want to say something no professor um i actually uh, okay said um, um, anybody else and then cuz i think it's great i just uh i do want i want you to get invested and i want you to do your posts where you sort this out and um and i guess the main thing is that to me it all goes back to the basic survival drives are pleasure and fear and religions tend to try and condition kids from when they're little and they do it either they use fear as a tool right to scare the heebie-jeebies out of a kid so that they'll behave or they try to get the kid to take pleasure in noble acts so that but you know this combination of force and um reward you know pleasure whatever so that those are the issues that every parent has to come up with i mean has to deal with I think it's unfortunate because I think certain kids are born with an orientation and for them to feel guilty just for being born I think is a mistake but um but that would be because I think science and religion have to be combined but what I want to show you is that the uh Catholic Church Augustine I mean Aquinas united reason and faith and fairly recently pope francis has come out saying who am i to judge so because it's based on science he does not condemn homosexuality and that is an old tradition in the catholic church when they united aristotle which was the science of the time 
with Christianity. So that's what was going on. So Aquinas, I mean, Augustine had a view of science, which is based on math. And he united this mathematical reasoning with Christianity, but Aquinas threw that out and united this biological Aristotelian notion of biological flourishing, a flourishing of the species with Christianity. And so the Catholic Church accepts evolution, not a problem, accepts homosexuality, not a problem. They accept, in theory, they accept the equality of women, but in practice, they'll never, they're never going to ordain, you know, there's never going to be a woman Pope. And I don't, I don't get that, right? <laughs> I don't understand how they think that's the total union of reason and faith. Uh, and so I just think they're fudging there. And I had a student write this long paper last semester about women in Catholicism. And he just decided it's hopeless. The church is never going to let go. Um, but anyway, at least my main point here is that it's an issue. And each of you should work it out in your mind. Um, and coming to AUW, in a way, it just threw you into an atmosphere where it would be natural for you to be doing that. And this class is just the opportunity for you to actually do it by reading some of the standard texts. So the other point that people made where, where even people from a lot of different traditions can understand the reasoning process, that's, that's important to me because when, when you call something a classic or a great book, the reason why it's a classic, the reason why it's great is because it was able to articulate uh, a line of reasoning that human beings just get, right? It'll click. It'll click that, that this is a natural way of thinking. And so that's why it's a great book. And those books tend, they're not uh, long. It's not a long book. And it's not a complicated book. There's a lot of other books you read and study that are a lot more complicated than that doesn't have any jargon, but it just punches the button. And But I do think, again, it shows our common humanity. It's just that I think when you're dealing with the survival instinct, it's, um, it's tricky to deal with pleasure and fear in a way that you can hit the mean between extremes. You don't go to an extreme. You don't fixate on an idea in order just to channel that energy or repress that energy. If you can have you know, that energy be released in a way that's productive, that doesn't go to an extreme, that doesn't weaponize some idea or some principle, that would be, that would be wisdom, right? You're not self-righteous. You're not judgmental. Um, but that's, that's a, a tough order. Um, all right, so let's go to, so let's go to uh, Aquinas. There's three um, issues here. The first one, I'm going to prove the existence of God to you in five ways. Okay, guys. <laughs> All right, so are you ready for this? Um, so this is again, the union of reason and faith. And it's how Aquinas did it. After, at his time, this was the union of science and religion. All right, so let's just, I go through it in, um, in your head. So I think if you've managed to get through Augustine, I'm sure probably the first time I started talking about it, it was kind of like, ah, what am I? Ah. <laughs> this is not what I usually talk about in class. But then if you realize, oh my gosh, yeah, there is that kind of uh, reasoning in my head. 
Um, am I recording this? Yes, Professor. Okay. <laughs> professor, I, I think I think these are very important topics to be discussed and we need to discuss this thing. Oh, very I'm, good. I'm thankful. Professor, we need a break. Oh yeah, you do need a break. Okay, take a break. Yeah, Thank you. natural time to break right now. Thank you, Professor. Many minutes. You have to remind me to turn on the recording button again, though. <laughs> the break over, Professor? Is, I think, yeah. I think, is that enough time? You guys ready to go after, go at it? No. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to move on here. Um, in your posts, you have to be honest. You just tell me if you actually, you know, were there the whole three hours. All right. Um, I need some sort of accountability. It's not that I don't trust you. It's just that, you know, I just need to know for sure. So just tell, just say how, how much time you took, how much time you're, the class is taking you. And then if you stayed in the class during the whole time. Um, all right, <clears throat> so what did Aquinas do? All right, so what I'm gonna give you is the proofs for the existence of God, but the word God simply means that the universe is ordered. That's it, that whatever comes to be, comes to be within the context of what already is, and so it's not true that chance and happenstance is a first principle of the universe. The, the most basic principle is this force of order that, um, so for example, the Big Bang, if you, if you think that's the Big Bang, it's a singularity what they say, but um, it, it opened up all sorts of potential. And it's actually the case that if the universe had been a quarter of a degree hotter, everything would have burned up early on, or a quarter of a degree colder, everything would have frozen up. Um, so, and it's just this emergence of higher and higher levels of complexity. And so, the, the inference is that there is an ordering force underneath everything that we see. That isn't a man, you know, with the anatomy of a man. It's not a man with a personality. It's not a, a grandpa with a beard. It's not, right? It's not a person at all. And so, you might be better off not saying the word God, whatever associations you have. Um, it's not that, right? All it is, is that material being, the way the physical world is, is such that it didn't, it, there needs to be another kind of reality in order to explain the way, the fact that it exists and the way it exists. So here's how it works. Um, here are the proofs. Okay, material reality does not move itself. Now, let me see if I can do this. This is what I do in class. All right, so I'm gonna show you that St. Thomas is totally stupid, okay? He says, matter doesn't move itself. Okay, I'm going to move myself. Ta-da. All right, I move myself. I mean, isn't that stupid? Like, what St. Thomas, what? How could he say that? All right, what do you guys think? What would he say to that? He has an answer to it. Totally agree with you. <laughs> this seems crazy. Okay, so anybody want to guess what he might answer to that? Didn't I just move myself? What was the first thing? 
What came first? Um, chemical energy and then to kinetic energy. What came and first? Before the matter moved. What came first was the idea. The idea. Right? The idea. Ha, ah, that's not material, right? So it was the idea that moved me. All right. What about if I decide, okay, guys, I'm going to levitate six, a foot off the ground just so you think I'm God, right? Just so I can show you how powerful philosophy is. I'm going to levitate myself right off, right off the ground. Okay, that's my idea. Am I going to do it? Depends. <laughs> I don't think so. Why? Because I don't have the potential, right? So every motion has an original immaterial aspect to it, and it has the potential. And then what you observe is this transition from potential to actual, okay? So for example, when I stand up, right, the idea I have the potential to go over there, I do it. I have the idea I'm gonna levitate off the ground, I don't have the potential, I don't do it. What if I walked into the room and I tripped over my own feet and I fell on the ground? I didn't have the idea, right? I hadn't planned to do it, but I had the potential to do it. And so it happened, right? So, what he's saying is that the universe uh, material being is potential, but there has to be some prior actuality. So God is the prior actuality of the origin of the universe. It couldn't have created itself. It couldn't have started itself. There has to be an unmoved mover, a different kind of reality. All right, so how do scientists answer that? Well, usually they say, I don't wanna think about it. <laughs> they do, or, you know, Bertrand Russell says, uh, so what, you know, they just don't care. Or they think it was just a total accident. Well, it's just, and Aristotle would say, it was a possibility, right? There was the potential for the for re material reality to begin, but there had to be this prior actuality that keeps it going, that sustains it. It doesn't it doesn't function just randomly. It's ordered in a certain way. Now that again, we tend to anthropomorphize that all the time. So it's not a person and it's not like the mind of a person but it has to be a different kind of reality matter doesn't create itself right so the word god simply refers to the uncreated a kind of a reality that was not itself created that was the original creator right it doesn't sustain itself. So I can't will that I exist tomorrow. They contingent things might or might not exist. Um, material reality doesn't sustain itself, but God exists necessarily, right? God is the unsustained sustainer. It doesn't order itself. So God is the unordered orderer, right? Just the first principle. Um, the and you know people, people can, people will say, well, reality is self-organizing, right? And so it looks to us like the things are organizing themselves, but there has to be that force, that principle where everything does drive toward higher and higher levels of existence. Um, so it's not random, it's not a crapshoot, not anything can happen tomorrow. 
there is this underlying principle of order. Um, all right. All right. So each individual thing behaves the way it needs to to survive. So, so this is the fifth proof is the one based on faith because the claim is that there is a personal God that has a plan for each individual thing. So the first four proofs are entirely indifferent, right? The first four proofs say the universe, there's a principle of order underneath things. And that's why eventually there could be this creature with the natural ability to understand. The universe had to be ordered before eventually there could ever be a creature that actually understood it. And the reason why we, under, we um, have survived is because this drive to understand patterns has worked. The patterns are out there and we have been able to be very fit. We have been able to adapt to the natural world and figured out how to survive because uh, the universe is ordered. So the first four proofs don't have a personal God. They don't, God is just this force and it's just explaining what our experience is nothing spooky or hokey. It's just saying, if the universe were totally random and by chance, there wouldn't be enough order for there ever to be the evolution of a creature that whose brain developed and who kept developing because of those patterns. But the fifth proof, this is where you get um, faith. So faith is the belief that there is a personal God that interacts with each individual thing and has a plan for the individual things. Okay, can we know God? Well, we can know God as that force underlying reality, uh, but no, uh, be the belief that God foreknows things, the belief, all those other beliefs, those are beliefs. That's a faith. You have to accept that on faith that God foreknows things, that God made himself into Christ, that Muhammad is the seal of the prophets, all those things, those are articles of faith. And then the personal relationship. If Augustine thinks God intervened in his life, that's also a matter of faith. So you can know God partly and partly not. Okay. So God is personal. Um, okay, God is the creator and sustainer. So everything, this is again by faith. Now, this, uh, this argument is reason, right? Okay, so the definition of God is God is one, right? And God's essence includes perfection, okay. Um, all right. So if you say God is perfect, I guess that's that's an article of faith, but then you reason about it, right? Okay, God is perfect and God is infinitely perfect. Okay, well, first of all, God is perfect. So God has to exist because you can't be perfect but not exist, right? Existence is one part of perfection. Um, so God necessarily exists. Just having that idea means that the, if the being is a unity and a per perfect, it has to exist. Then the next aspect of the definition is God is infinitely perfect. And if, if that's true, there can only be one. Why? Okay, suppose... God is infinitely perfect, but there's two of them. How would you tell the difference? Well, one of them is not perfect. Oops, then it wouldn't be God. And one of them is not infinite. Oops, that wouldn't be God either. So if God is infinitely perfect, there's only one. 
Okay. Let's see, the creation is ordered, right? According to certain principles. And scientists know this, like uh, Einstein, E equals MC squared. So the, the principles, the formulas that are the most comprehensive are also the most simple because the universe functions according to these most basic, simple principles. And then things get more complicated the more immediate it gets. So for example, evolution on earth is a lot more complicated, but um, it's, it's only a very small part of the universe. So being, the being has these very simple principles that it works on. And then there's the four forces. There's the weak nuclear force, the strong nuclear force, electromagnetism, and gravity, right? So, so that, that's the idea, is that the more comprehensive it is, your, the more comprehensive your explanation covers, the more simple the principles are, because the ordering is simple, and then the more immediate it gets, the more complicated it gets, but it doesn't last as long, or it doesn't apply as much to other things, like principles related to living beings, like the biosphere, um, those principles don't hold over in Venus or Pluto or something, but they hold within this realm. Everything that comes to be, every, every new species, right? Genetic mutation. When you look at it, people say, well, that's all chance and accident. Well, the Aristotelian answer is that this constant muting, mut, mutating of the genes, this is why the pandemic, why there are variations, because there's this constant process going on. Well, that process is what enables the maximum potential, okay? But what of the, all that potential, the thing that becomes actual, the, the mute, the variation of the COVID, if it is actually going to become actual, it's because of the order that was already there. That the ordering, you know, the reality that was there made it possible for one of these mutations to actually succeed. And that's, that's how evolution works. It's always within this context. And that's why it's ordered. It's an ordered process and we can study it um, because the first principle, the most important force is the force of order because it limits all this potential in the mutation process. So that's why uh, we say wear masks, get vaccinated, don't create an environment where there's a potential for a mut mutated, a mutant version of COVID to thrive, right? This is common sense, actually. It's, we use this all the time, but we don't think about the principles underneath it. The principle is order is more powerful than disorder. The universe has both. In order to maximize its potential, potential being, right? Those mutations make a whole lot of things possible, but not actual. So when they become actual, it's in, it's in the context of order, and that's why you can understand. That's why you can have you can have the science of biology. You can study life on Earth and how it is, how it exists, how it functions, how it works, because it's ordered enough to be able to study it. Um, okay, so then. God's, if you think of God as a mind, right? Mind uh, orders everything. Um, God is truth because when we say something's true, it means that what's in our minds corresponds to what's out there. But that's only possible if things are ordered. So God is the source of all truth. 
because God is the source of all order, then God chose, excuse me, God chose to create the universe. So God must have had a will, right? God could have chosen it or not chosen it. Um, okay. The perfection of the uni material universe is different from the, excuse me, perfection of God. And then when we choose um, uh, the natural object of the will is to love God and love your neighbor as yourself. So the natural object of, you know, the will should not choose evil, right? It should choose good and it should um, love the good. That's the emotion that has to drive the will, to love the good. And so if God has a will and chose to create the universe, God is love. Like that is the ultimate paradigm of love is to love the world so much that you create the universe. Um, then there's God's causality. Um, God's the cause of things in the sense of the cause of order that has led to the, all these different ordered systems. Um, and But also on a religious view, God is the cause of individuals and affects their lives. Um, okay, so, all right. Then there's, what are we at? 36. All right, let me stop for a minute. Um, all right, questions about the nature of God. Um, professor, I did not understand the two gods thing. If there were two, right? Okay. If you define God as infinitely perfect, okay? Okay. There can only be one. What you're trying to prove is there can only be one. So then you hypothesize. Suppose there's two. Well, how would they be different? One would have to not be infinite. Oops. I mean, they can't both be infinitely perfect, right? But why not? <laughs> because they're in, it's infinite, right? So they have to somehow be different, right? If they're both. I mean, like, why is it a necessity for them to be different? Why can't they be the same? Okay, because infinity uh, encompasses everything. And then perfection encompasses the highest, right? Um, makes sense. Yeah. Does it make sense? Yeah. Okay. So, professor, like, um, there can be two things that are in the highest, right? Like, you can have two winners, right? In a race, they end up as, right. I mean, both in the first position. So, can't these two gods? both be in the highest position and both be eternal. But they can't both be infinite. But why not? Well, they're different. If, they, if, I mean, to be infinite means they end up the same being. Does that make sense? Yeah. They would end yeah. up being the same being because there can only be one. Uh, okay, I mean, Again, this is not what you guys usually roam around talking about. But on the other hand, it is amazing to me that if I say it enough times, I think your brain actually can wrap around it. You know, it is kind of natural back there in the back of our minds to think about stuff like that. So, I mean, little kids ask these questions, right? Is the universe infinite or who's God's mother? <laughs> you know, they, they naturally wonder about all this stuff. Um, and so this is just sorting it out. Any other questions, though? Again, uh, throwing it out to you the first time. We'll start next time with the second, second shot, right? Um, all right, so let me go to the next issue. So this is, 
Okay. Uh, when I was when I last watched TV, which is about 50 years ago, honest to goodness, sorry, I apologize. Um, they there used to be this ad for this certain kind of mint that you eat, and it was a candy mint and a breath mint, right? And so it would say two mints, two mints in one. All right. So St. Thomas Aquinas is just like that. Every single question you ask, he says, there's two answers, <laughs> okay? So what is truth, all right? There's revealed truth through faith, and then there's learned truth through reason. Does everybody understand this, where we're going? Okay, what's the goal of life? There's two goals in life. There's salvation is the goal of faith and knowledge or wisdom is the goal of reason, okay? What about God's existence? There's lots of ways to prove God's existence. There's two proofs through reason, through studying the, the nature of the universe, the nature of being. And then there's this other one by faith that God has an individual stake, you know, awareness of each individual thing and each individual person. Okay, what about our ability to know God? Well, yes and no. <laughs> okay, reason can know God simply as the first principle, the ordering force in the universe, but faith sees God through through a state of grace, right? You have to you have to uh, repent and be forgiven and develop this relationship to God based on grace. Uh, and that would be another kind of seeing, another kind of knowing God. Okay. God's emotions. All right. According to reason, um, God doesn't have emotions, right? God is a force. Um, whereas in faith, there's love, right? God loved the world, created the universe. Um, God's knowledge, all right. So on the rational view, what's, what doesn't change is this principle of order. And that would just be at the level of species or planets, or it wouldn't be particular. Whereas in faith, there's the particular aspects. So on the Greek view, for know thyself, how would I, what would that be? I would know myself as having this capacity to understand in a world that's understandable. And that's completely indifferent to anything personal about me. So I have to make, I have to try to achieve a goal that's completely impersonal. It's species. I wanna be a member, flourishing member of the species. So I always have to compare myself to these standards that are not particular to me. They're universal, right? Whereas on the view of faith, then there's these particular things. God has a particular plan or God set me up for this or that, right? That's just a matter of faith. Now, what about the origin story? Well, Aristotle would just say the universe, there was a potential. The universe potentially existed, but there was a prior actuality, uh, uh, ordering force. And at a certain point in time, the potential became actual. But, but the important part of one's understanding is not based on anything profound about that switch from potential to actual, from not material to material. Whereas on the Muslim and the Christian and the Jewish view, this is fundamental that there was a God and God created the universe from nothing out of you know, will and out of love. 
And then God also has control over that universe and can intervene. That's, that's the view based on faith. Okay, what about human happiness? There's two kinds of human happiness, right? There's divine uh, living by grace and the articles of faith. And then there's the, okay, the theological virtues are faith, hope for eternal life and charity, which, which means uh, forgiving your neighbor seven times, 70 times. Um, I know that in the Quran, there's 10 times more references to mercy than to punishment, right? And the Old Testament, you know, God punishes also. But Jesus just talked about forgiveness. Whereas the other kind of happiness is based on reason and the virtues. There's two kinds of law. There's divine law and there's human law. And so, and there's the old law in the Old Testament and the new law. And then again, the Quran. I think it's interesting um, that then the Quran has another set of, of laws. Okay, so let's see. And then in the St. Thomas, this is the key for St. Thomas's view, it's called natural law. So the order of the universe, the natural order is called eternal law, right? That comes from Augustine, but, uh, Aquinas uh, talk, uses natural law to refer to specifically an Aristotelian take on that. And then there's temporal laws where um, a judge, again, throws someone in prison to punish them, right? You stole somebody's property. You have to go to prison until you learn how to stop doing that. Um, so it can use force, it can take away people's temporal freedom, but it cannot, it can't convert you, it can't make you love God, it can't make you, uh, you know, anything, it can't change your inner life at all, all it can do is change your outer life, but we have this natural capacity to understand these principles that are natural, and to apply them in our lives. So uh, final causes, he's going to focus on final causes, the purpose of everything. Everything, every species has a natural purpose. The entire natural world is ordered. Plants and animals are ordered according to their complexity. Um, the purpose of human life is to know that's Aristotle and St. Thomas, human knowledge is not based on innate ideas, that's Augustine, but on observing and thinking about nature, that's Aristotle. Um, the order, okay, the order of the laws is eternal. It doesn't change, but the, but the laws are attached to the natural world. It's just that the natural world functions according to these unchanging laws. We were intended to understand the creation. Um, the capacity to understand these laws is called natural law. Let's see. Um, let's see. Then there's divine law. I've got a... I'm, I'm going to run out of time for it. So I'm going to scroll through this. You can get a sense of where we're going. The old law, the law of Moses versus the new law, the law of Jesus. And then the uh, Muslims would say, right? The law that the Quran, right? Um, so you can understand how Islam um, is a, an extension of Judaism, Christianity, Islam. I mean, it makes sense the way it fits together. It doesn't mean you have to believe it or any of it. It's just important that it makes sense. And so it's compelling to people. People can be told this stuff and they believe it.
because it makes sense. Um, let's see. Then, what else? This was just, ah, let me see. Where was I going with? Ah, uh, yeah, okay. So next time I will go further and human laws can be changed, but that, okay. So now we're going into the nature of human law, all right? Should, they shouldn't be changed constantly. Um, justice is this character trait. This goes back to Aristotle, which leads a person to consistently be willing to rule for the sake of the ruled, to punish in proportion, right, appropriately. Um, justice requires each person be given what's appropriate for them. Um, but when, okay, this is important, when societies are unjust and not everyone is given what they deserve, then um, you should, you should have a natural law requires you to take from the rich and give to the poor, right? So having these laws where you tax the rich for the benefit of the poor, that's according to natural law and divine law, okay? Um, let's see. If people are desperate, um, it's lawful for you to steal, okay? <laughs> this is St. Thomas, okay? If people are desperate. Um, the desire for more than you need is a sin. Sometimes it's lawful to declare war and sometimes it's lawful to kill in self-defense. But the thing I want to get at is sometimes it's lawful to rebel against your own society, okay? In a tyrannical government, um, it's not a sin to bring it down, right? To replace it with a different government. Um, so the stereotype, is that the church church institutions are, are uh, conservative, right? And they tend not to recommend <laughs> destroying the government, right? But it's possible if it gets bad enough, then it's okay. And that's straight out of St. Thomas. So I, I put this in because I've lived with nuns for nine different summers for about a month. And I just want to show again, they have these basic values. And I think the basic values are pretty universal and you can look at them if you want to. Um, dialogue is big, moderation is big, justice, hospitality, all this stuff. Um, let's see. And here's where we get to Pope Francis and he stood before the UN. So this is where I wanna get the link between the UN and the Catholic Church because the United Nations is very involved in developing countries. And I think people from developing countries are, are aware of the impact of the UN, the goals of the UN. Um, so Francis spoke before the, the General Assembly, and, and it would be nice. I would like you to read this article. He's scolding people for being greedy and sinful and all that. Um, but here's the outline. I have an outline of what he said. Okay, here's issues that he, that he reject religious bigotry, right? So that's what we were getting at before. Um, don't use religion to be a bigot, right? Um, no, every human religion can be corrupt, he's pointing out, which is what we were saying. Reject partisan bickering, right? Politicians need to be uh, addressing problems and not demonizing each other. Stop punishing immigrants, right? help Europe's refugee crisis. Um, 
foreign policy cannot be guided by might makes right, right? It isn't just that the powerful will win because they're powerful, right? The golden rule is important. That's true of every major religion and every kind of humanism. So I want you to, to realize that the Pope knows the humanist tradition, right? St. Thomas, I mean, Aristotle. He's totally raised with Aristotle and the union of Aristotle and Christianity. So he's emphasizing all these humanistic values because he knows he's speaking in front of an audience and some of them would describe themselves as secular humanists. So he's presenting not only Catholicism and not only Christianity, but he's presenting religions per se from a humanistic point of view. And he's saying the really honest religions, any religion is humanist, right? It would agree uh, every sort of humanist leader, religious leader should agree to what he's saying. Stop the global arms trade, that would go against any religious or humanist tradition and the death penalty, address inequality, create good jobs, stop ignoring, ignoring climate change, um, show real leadership, right? Set a model for people to imitate, um, stop needless conflict. So, so that's, that's the thing for you to think about here. Do you think that this, what he said is the kind of bridge between humanism and all the religions? Do you agree with these principles or these attitudes, these suggestions? And this is practical wisdom, right? This is Aristotle's practical wisdom. He's talking, it's a more general thing then you have to get down to the particulars. Okay, climate change. Okay, climate change where? Climate change in Bangladesh. Okay, which part of it? The flooding or the, the this or the that, right? So you, you constantly have to get into more specifics, but this is at a, a level that's more specific than when I was talking about Aristotle, right? So here's another level of particular, and then it would get more and more particular over time. Let's see. Here's uh, Francis changing the church's view on L, LB, you know, whatever. It, you know, that's fine. There's always another letter going on and that's fine. Um, we have on our campus, it's called spectra. It's just the spectrum, you know, that the binary is, is not doesn't describe all people, there's a whole spectrum. So that's how they do it at our school. So the Catholic Church has become more opening, open to LBGYTQ plus. God doesn't condemn them. Uh, the church could be open to civil unions. The civil unions are done by the state. Um, he wouldn't, you know, he wouldn't want, I don't think he's gonna allow marriage but he is gonna, because of that man and a woman thing, but he would allow civil unions. Um, okay. All right. And then this one, yeah, then there's another article about that. Let's see. And this one is evolution. God is not a musician, uh, magician. So this is where the Catholic Church is splitting off from the Baptists. I don't know how much you know, but the Baptist Church in the US is huge. I think over 50% of Americans don't accept evolution, if you can believe that. It's, <laughs> it's just shocking to me. But over 50% of Americans split reason from faith. Um, all right. <laughs> America was founded by enlightenment thinkers and it was founded with liberal arts education, uniting reason and faith. And we're, we're going backwards in terms of our 
the sophistication of our our uh, souls, basically, the relation between the moral virtues and intellectual virtues, we're becoming more anti-intellectual, which is scary. Um, the other thing I'm going to talk about next time is how Martin Luther King and the Black Lives Matter movement, the civil rights movement, applies these principles of Aristotle and Aquinas. And again, and I would like those of you who are raised would any other tradition or humanist tradition to always be seeing the analogies. These are the examples from the tradition I knew about. Some of you know about the Old Testament, right? Somebody was citing uh, Joseph, um, but it doesn't matter. Like you have your own stories. You have Hindu stories, Buddha stories, Muslim stories, humanist stories, Confucian stories, whatever. Uh, it's about civil disobedience. Um, let's see, Aristotle and segregationist laws, Seneca, Augustine, St. Thomas, um, moderates. All right, and so he does talk about what's the difference between whether a law is just or unjust. And he cites these concepts of natural law. And I have the outline, some of the stuff. But when it comes to actually reading it, again, it starts on page eight here. And you only have to read to page 14. But I do want you to read it because it does, it's a good example of taking this tradition of natural law and human law and God and uniting reason and faith, applying it to the legal tradition, saying temporal laws, yes, they're different from natural law, eternal law, but they, they should not contradict natural law. And so temporal laws are accountable to a higher standard. This again is absolutely fundamental if you want a democracy. You have to have religious leaders, intellectuals questioning the decisions that the lawmakers and the politicians make in light of a more universal truth. Um, something is never uh, just, just because it's in the law, right? The laws of any society can be wrong. They have to be evaluated by another higher standard. Sometimes the laws are okay. The corruption comes in when the people apply the laws, okay? So the justices are corrupt. So, you know, the legislators might make a good law, but the justices or the juries that apply and decide who's breaking the law or not, that's all corrupted. Um, so he makes all those distinctions. Um, and I, I think it's, again, a good example of what happens a lot. I mean, there are, during the Black Lives Matter this past summer, a year ago, I guess, almost now, there were demonstrations all over the world. And these demonstrations, some of the people were demonstrating just in the name of humanism and um, the golden rule or the scientific knowledge that people are by nature the same and sexism is wrong according to science. Racism is wrong according to science. And having a gap between the rich and the poor is wrong because our humanity is the same. Societies that allow for these huge gaps are based on a lie. It's a lie that some people deserve uh, to be a lot richer than others. It's unhealthy psychologically too. So, so again, when you're thinking of a healthy psyche, it, it's a, it perverts the psyche of a child 
to be too wealthy or too poor because they can't grow up in a natural way. It also perverts them, I think. Um, little kids should not be conscious of how much money their parents make. They don't naturally care about that at all. You have to teach them to care about that. And it's a perversion. <laughs> anyway, so in Black Lives Matter, all those movements are based on reason. And there were lots of demonstrators who also were basing their movement on faith, especially African-Americans in the US, but it was reason united with faith. So, um, so I would like you to read eventually, you might not get through it for next class, but by the time we finish this, I'd like you to get through page 14. So that's six pages of a lot of stuff. Um, let's see. So I we have five minutes. I did want to say that my father actually marched in Selma, Alabama with Martin Luther King and he met him and stuff. Um, and I was in um, fifth grade at the time. And I was um, there was a Unitarian preacher that got killed when my father was there. And, you know, it was just this rumor that somebody got killed and my mother was all worried. And it turns out he was, he got killed when he was going to dinner on Saturday night or whatever night it was. It turns out my dad had gotten invited by that very guy to go to dinner with him that night. <laughs> But he didn't, he actually turned him down and went somewhere else. But I remember that as a kid, it sort of freaked me out. Um, but it, it really has disappointed me. It's just been heartbreaking that racism persists. And I really thought in high school that racism, sexism, destruction of the environment, that we'd be in a much better place by now and um, well, sorry. Anyway, so what you have to do is pick up and say, okay, the generations before me handed me this, but psychologically, like you can't let it get you down, right? Because that only makes it worse. You have to find psychological strength in saying, yeah, but I want to pass on something better to my kids. And all of you are in a position where you can really do that. So um, anyway, so the theme on August on Aquinas is the fact that you unite reason and faith and that's not conservative necessarily. It's actually, it should, it should always be tend toward being progressive because uh, when the church doesn't question political leaders or it supports political leaders, they get corrupt. So the church should always be holding the, holding the politicians' feet to the fire, right? Always asking them to justify what they do. And so that's progressive. And also the church shouldn't be sexist or racist or classist, right? It should be progressive, really. And it, it, hard, it isn't. Like right now, there are these huge movements of conservative religion, religion that supports the status quo, religion that supports authoritarian leaders. But then there's also this huge movement. So in a sense, the whole world is sort of schizophrenic, right? There are the progressives and there are the conservatives. And they're just sort of magnifying because of social media and all these ways that we have communication. But that just gives you an opportunity. It, what's always been true is that all these changes make the potential for both good or evil, they just grows. So I think all of you have just a whole lot of opportunity to, to be aware of all this stuff going on 
and to sort of position yourself, right? So maybe you were raised with conservative religion, but you really want to be progressive religion, right? Because the progressive branches makes more sense to you, but then you have to explain it. And then some, some other student is gonna say, I'm getting rid of that religion, forget it. I'm gonna be secular, forget it. I don't want anything to do with it. That's fine. Just give me some good reasons and I'm all on board. All right, so I'm gonna let you go. And if you want to have more questions or something, we can, I'll stay here until your questions are done. Uh, Professor, 